Dr. Eiley, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. Um, I, I thought you might be able to introduce yourself better than I can. Could you tell us about some of the awesome things that you do? Yeah, sure. I'm really happy to be here. Um, so I am currently faculty at the North Carolina School of Science and Math. I teach in the biology department. Um, and before that, I kind of got into science a little bit late in the game. As a kid, I grew up in a really rural area of Florida, so much so that they still herded cattle on horseback. Um, and so my siblings and I played outside a ton. And so um, that kind of, you know, exposure to the world around me um, is probably why I love science as much as I do. Um, and, you know, I won't give all of the details to connect the dots, uh, but leaving high school, I decided to go to undergrad uh, and my advisor studied uh, plants. And so he gave me some uh, introduction into what research was like. So I researched carnivorous pitcher plants for a time. And then working with him um, is really what sparked me to make the choice to go to grad school. So during my time in grad school, I did my PhD through Duke's uh, biology program and focused on plant bacterial symbioses. So how do plants and microorganisms live together and in particular focus on these teeny tiny ferns and these cyanobacteria that they live in relationship with. Um, but along the way I also did things using improv to help scientists learn how to communicate and engage the public which was really fun and continues to be really fun um, as well as doing work in diversity and inclusion uh, all with kind of the goal of making science more accessible for everybody um, so I think those things all kind of couple hand in hand really well um, so I did my postdoc at Duke's uh, initiative for science and society focused on that kind of aspect of science communication and science interdisciplinary work, all in ways to kind of deepen how science is connected to the world around us. That's a, that's a lot of hats, as they say, that's a lot of things. <laughs> luckily, I have a good head for hats. <laughs> <laughs> and, and luckily, we, can, we get to hear about it from you. Um, I, I know whenever we get the chance to uh, talk to scientists, um, I wonder about what inspired them to do the work that they do. Um, did you, it sounds like you didn't always want to be a scientist. What first got you interested? Yeah, so um, I definitely, yeah, I, I found science um, late. And I think in high school, I had a really wonderful AP biology teacher. Um, and she, so her husband actually was biology faculty at the college that I eventually went to. Um, but she really gave us the chance and using materials that he had on campus, gave us the chance to like develop and design experiments in class. Um, and so I think that's not always the case that students in high school get the ability to like, you know, come up with an idea and then are handed the materials to be able to pull that idea together. Um, and so that kind of, you know, helped that like interest in science stay alive by having a really good teacher. Um, and then in undergrad, it really came down to the relationship that I had with my undergrad advisor. Um, he was the, so because I was a late admissions to my undergrad, and we can talk about that later because I was gonna take a very different path than I actually ended up being on. Um, I ended up being off track in my biology major. So I ended up taking courses way out of sequence. And so, um, you know, as a younger student in undergrad, I was ended up taking like courses that had like juniors and seniors in them. Um, and one of the first courses I took with my advisor was actually a journal club course. And it was all focused on uh, plant immunity. So like if your plants get you know, infected by fungi, bacteria, viruses, how do they fight it off? Um, and he really, that class was small because I was a younger student, he really took time to kind of help me develop uh, in understanding scientific literature. And it helped us really build a solid just foundation as, as advisor and advisee. Um, and that kind of just blossomed in the other courses that I took. I tried to take, you know, as many science courses with him as I could. Um, and he helped me get, you know, scholarships and grants to help pay for my college um, and to give me extra research experiences. Um, and it really was his, you know, 
passion and uh, care in mentoring me um, that kind of fostered my growth as a scientist. And so in a lot of ways, like I look back now and I'm like, I kind of became an incidental plant biologist, but it really was because I had somebody take a careful interest in seeing a brightness in me um, and helping me develop as a scientist. So I owe a lot to him for sure. Sounds like that's kind of the track that you're on now with with other young scientists that you're looking to to inspire them, and I know that you certainly inspire me. Um, and and thank you for 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 kind of giving us this this window into the fact that it's not always super straightforward. We don't always know directly from the get go, um, but it sounds like you found a great way to follow your interests um, and, and honor a lot of your passions. Um, I'm, I'm always interested in hearing more about um, the successes and failures that you might have um, encountered along the way, because both are such an important part of the scientific process. Um, can you tell us something related to your work that you feel proud of, and, and maybe something that um, didn't go exactly as you'd planned? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a really important, especially kind of the failures part, important to have these sorts of like discussions and talk about them. The successes often get, you know, celebrated and then the failures are kind of like, who? Um, but in kind of looking back and thinking of successes, um, in thinking about in particular, like my scientific career, um, one thing that I've, I've been really proud of, um, so for the organism that I studied uh, as a graduate student. So it's this little itty bitty aquatic fern. And I wanted to do some microscopy lo work looking inside the like um, cavity where it has all of these bacteria. And so there are all these different, you know, protocols for how to take images in plants. Um, and so I was like, this should be pretty straightforward. This should be, you know, pretty spot on and simple. And I, it wasn't uh, in large part because of the fact that the plant's aquatic and a lot of the solutions you need to actually get plants to a place where you can start to like see the tissue inside you can't actually submerge the plant in any of those liquids to like get it to cooperate with you. And so it was this massive undertaking of just like trial and error with these different microscopy techniques and kind of troubleshooting, okay, this is almost where I want it to be. And then talking, I think I talked to almost every microscopy core on like Duke's campus. Um, and when I was kind of wrapping up my PhD work, I was like, I'm gonna continue trying to see if I can get this to work. And uh, one, one morning actually, I was sitting at the microscope, one of the machines I needed to like, um, get my plants uh, in solution um, actually like messed up overnight um, and I was like I don't know if this is gonna work but I really hope that it's going to and lo and behold like there was the image that I wanted to see inside the pocket with all the details of the plant cells the bacteria cells all intermingled with one another and I legitimately started crying as I was sitting at the microscope because I was like I have been working so hard to see this thing and now here it is um, and so that was just a really cool moment and I think it encapsulates an aspect of science that a lot of us uh, in science um, are moved by that moment of discovery where something works and like you've seen something for the first time that like other people haven't gotten a chance to see yet um, and so I like was taking pictures of the like screen of the computer with my phone to like send to like my family members and like friends be like it worked it worked it worked um, and it was just a really cool really cool really awesome moment so definitely that one for um, just kind of thinking about my scientific career in general. And there are other, you know, proud moments of the interdisciplinary work that I did. But when I'm wearing my hat as a scientist, that one sticks out. Um, and then when it comes to failures, this is also a plant microscopy story because plants are finicky. Um, when I was an undergraduate and I was working with my advisor on my honors uh, research thesis, uh, we were studying how uh, the pitchers in carnivorous pitcher plants create their digestive enzymes to eat their prey. So just like our guts make enzymes to digest our food, their pitchers do the same exact thing. But our question was, do they make all of these enzymes at the same time? Uh, do they continually make them throughout the lifespan of the pitcher? Are there particular tissues that like make these enzymes? And so we were trying to track down where and when in the pitcher these enzymes are being made using a uh, fluorescent microscopy to kind of do it. So kind of taking pictures of tissue, using these different fluorescent colored labels to like see what's going on. 
And so we're trying to take these pictures, we're trying to take these pictures, and we just keep getting just like background fluorescence in all our tissues from our plants and can't see what we're looking for at all. Like negative controls, positive controls, doesn't matter what we're doing, we're just not getting what we need. And so again, we kind of just continue troubleshooting thing after thing after thing after thing. We max out the capabilities of like the microscope that we have to do this. Um, and it was really frustrating, but it really taught me that like sometimes things just don't cooperate with you in science. Um, and so my thesis very much was a tale of how to try to solve a problem that doesn't want to be solved. <laughs> and so it was, it was frustrating, but it's just one of those things in science that sometimes you just like have to like, you know, learn how to grapple with. And so leaving undergrad it was, it was very frustrating that we like didn't get to an end point in it. And it did feel like a failure. And then my first year of graduate school, I was like, get emails where it's like, these are new things in science. And there was an article in it about pitcher plants uh, where scientists had discovered that actually to attract their prey, there are species that produce pigments that fluoresce so that their prey can see it. And then they're like, oh, this is super cool. And then they get trapped. So yeah. So you were, you were trying to use something to almost like highlight, like, almost like using a highlighter to see it. It turns yeah. out they produce highlighter colors themselves. <laughs> exactly. And so it was just like we were seeing this natural, real thing, and we just had no idea that it was there, but it was like in the way of all of our experiments. So I sent it to my undergrad advisor, and we had a good laugh about the fact that our failure actually was something reportable that somebody else discovered. <laughs> That's such a great, I love that story. Um, I love that it became something that, that you discovered. It came in, became an opportunity to learn, I guess. Um, all the best failures are, are like that, I guess. Um, so, and I wanted to go back a little bit because you said that for your PhD, you studied um, some, some aspects of plant biology and cyanobacteria. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit more in the program about um, what particularly cyanobacteria is. Um, and we're going to be doing a project that's related to it. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about, about what you found in your research and kind of what you learned. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so my work was focused on uh, these ferns named Azola, uh, and they're the, a full-grown plant is small enough that it can fit on your thumbnail. That's as big as they're gonna get. Yeah, they're that bitty. And inside each of their leaves, they have this cavity that houses the cyanobacteria. And so cyanobacteria can do a whole host of different things in the environment. And the ones that are special in Azola actually do what's called nitrogen fixation. And so in the atmosphere, it's largely made up of nitrogen, and it's two nitrogen atoms triple bonded together, which is a super, super strong bond. And you and me can't break that bond. We don't have the molecular machinery to be able to do it. But these cyanobacteria do, and so they have this way of bringing in nitrogen from the atmosphere, busting apart that triple bond, and then turning that nitrogen into like things that you can eat and use and do other things that a cell might need to do with. And so in this symbiosis, they make nitrogen nutrients and they send it out to the plant. And in return, the plant photosynthesizes, makes sugars, and sends those sugars to the bacteria. So each of them feeds the other one. And so they've been living in this type of symbiosis for over 90 million years, which is like a crazy long amount of time. But we don't know how they communicate with one another. And so there's such a tight relationship that the bacteria or the cyanobacteria is only found in living Isola plants. It can't live on its own anymore. And so we were interested in figuring out, well, what things is the plant doing to support the life of the cyanobacteria and talk to it? And so I did experiments where we took the cyanobacteria away from the plant um, and compared that to plants that had their cyanobacteria to try and hunt down what genes are responsible in the plant for conducting this relationship with this bacteria. And so 
Um, as you would expect, you know, some nutrient transporters to allow the shuttling of foods back and forth between the two partners were important. And then we also found different kind of chemical signaling mechanisms um, that plants produce a lot of for lots of different reasons that we think are involved in how they tell the cyanobacteria um, when it's time to make nitrogen, when it's not yet time to make nitrogen, etc. So it, it was really neat to kind of tap into something that is, you know, ancient and then trying to figure out kind of the secrets of what's going on there. I love that you were kind of putting an ear to try and figure out, you know, these, these two organisms that live together. In fact, one of them lives inside of the other one. How do they talk to each other? And, and you, you also drew a connection between science and society and how communication happens between them. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. I think the two aspects of kind of how I think about science um, really merged together uh, in the work that I did um, in thinking about communication between these two organisms and then thinking about communication between science and society. And um, in kind of thinking about that puzzle of um, how are science and society connected? The plant system that I studied also has all of these different um, like environmental impacts. So uh, researchers are interested in it for um, creating biofuels so that we can replace gasoline for combating climate change because it grows so quickly. It can pull CO2 out of the atmosphere really fast and has played a really critical role in the climate that we enjoy today, um, as well as being used in agricultural practices as a green fertilizer. So as a safe alternative to industrial fertilizers that get um, used instead. And so we have all these really neat, really cool environmental impacts and the way that that is important is when you're able to share those findings about this plant with society so that it can go and be used for those purposes. And so in being a scientist, but then also in having all of these other interests in arts and humanities and how I used improv and did improv as a hobby and then used it for science communication. Um, and then also being a minority in science myself, I just really got to thinking about uh, access to science and who has access to science, both in terms of the exposure to it and the ability to use it in their daily lives and understand it, and who is doing science. And so um, I did a lot of uh, work on kind of both fronts of helping prepare scientists to communicate and share their work and uh, engage in outreach events like this one, where they get to share their work with people, um, but then also helping to create environments where minority students feel like they are supported and can excel in science and kind of making space for um, folks who might want to ask different questions or have um, different talents and different skills that they can bring to science as a discipline. Um, and in kind of thinking about how to create that space and a thing that came out of it was the science and art exhibit that I started with some uh, grad school um, friends. So we uh, were focused on kind of science communication and science outreach and uh, we created this exhibit where we have artists and scientists working together uh, to create pieces inspired by scientists work um, in large part because art connects to you in a, an emotional way. And so it gives you this different avenue to experience and start learning about science. And so um, it's been going on four years running now. Um, it's called The Art of a Scientist. And it's just been a really awesome thing to create. When you'd mentioned before of like a proud moments, it's something that I'm also really, really proud of, of just building this space where we have these two disciplines merged together and we get to learn from both of them um, is really, really special and a neat way to bring science and society closer together. It sounds, it sounds so cool. And, and we often think of science and art as being really different. So the idea of the art of a scientist might sound kind of strange to us at first. Um, I, I was wondering if you could tell us about maybe, uh, maybe some of those connections, like an example of um, a way that those have been connected. Yeah, so one of my uh, favorite examples um, has to do with a, a scientist, her name is Julia, she studies sea anemones and how they see in their environment, and then an artist, her name is Carson, and she works in uh, charcoals and she does photography. And Julia, in studying sea anemones and how they see the world around them, um, 
her, the lab that she works in has this computer program where you can put in the aspects of like a critter's eye that you're interested in, feed it an image, and then it'll give you an approximation of this is how this animal sees things. And so Julia went, or uh, Carson went out into Duke Forest and took pictures in Duke Forest and then sent those pictures to Julia to run through that program and then created a, um, a piece that mimicked the structure of a sea anemone's eye organ with the like photo of this is how if you were a sea anemone and you were plopped into the middle of Duke Forest, this is what you would see. And so it just gives you something that you couldn't really experience otherwise from just a scientific talk by having an artist be a part of this process. And so kind of connections like that have come out of this that I think are just like so incredibly awesome. I love the way that they, there's kind of a symbiosis going on there where they kind of benefit one another. That is so cool. And I, I guess we might also say that um, both, uh, both art and science kind of expand our perspectives. So they, they show us things that we wouldn't be able to know or, or see otherwise. Yeah. I, I love that. Do Dr. Eiley, you have such a, a wonderful body of work and a wonderful way of looking at the world. And I, I want to thank you for sharing that with us today. Um, and, I, and I guess I would ask if there's anything else you might want to share with our young scientist friends today. Yeah, I would say first and foremost, uh, I have gone on this journey and continued keeping the multidisciplinary things that I love a part of me, uh, little bits of theater and art and science all woven together. So I'll never feel like you have to choose one if you love more than one. Um, and uh, we do have our next exhibit of the Art of a Scientist opening this spring, so it'll be a, a virtual experience. Um, and so it'll open, we're being hosted by the Power Plant Gallery in Durham, so you'll be able to find it on their website come March. Um, yeah. That's great. Thank you. I will make sure that I pass that on to them as well, and I'm really excited to see it, so I'll be on the lookout for it. Um, Dr. Eiley, thank you so much for, for talking with us today, um, and I, I really, yeah, I really look forward to um, our own kind of deeper dive into some of these subjects, and, and thank you so much for showing us um, all that you have to offer. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me and enjoy making uh, your cyanobacteria activities later. Thank you so much. All right. I'll see you later. Bye.